everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Danielle Daw. I'm the Adult Services Librarian here at the Halton Hills Public Library, and I will be your host for this evening. I'd like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather tonight is part of the treaty land and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I also want to thank the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library and CFUW Georgetown for their support of the Halton Hills Lecture Series. Now, before we begin, um, we just have a few housekeeping items. So the Q&A for tonight's lecture is going to be taking place through the chat box. Um, now, if you're new to the chat box, you'll find it at the bottom of your screen on Zoom if you're on a computer. If you're on a phone or tablet, um, you should have an option somewhere that says um, either more options or another menu that will let you find the chat box. Now, when you're asking your question, um, we do ask that you direct it to everybody who's on the call. Um, and that way we can all see the questions that are coming in. Please also note that we are recording tonight's lecture and it will be available on YouTube later this month. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker. Natasha Henry is the president of Ontario Black History Society. She's an educator, historian and curriculum consultant who specializes in the development of learning materials that focus on experiences of forced displacement of African people during slavery. Natasha is the author of many books including Emancipation Day, Celebrating Freedom in Canada, uh, Talking About Freedom, Celebrating Emancipation Day in Canada, and African Canadian First. Natasha was also the education specialist for Breaking Chains, presenting a new narrative of Canada's role in the Underground Railroad. Through her various professional and community roles, Natasha's focus is on researching, collecting, preserving, and disseminating the histories of Black Canadians. She is currently completing her PhD in history at York University, researching the enslavement of Africans in early Ontario. And now without further ado, here is Natasha Henry. Thank you very much, Danielle. Um, and thanks to Heather as well. I am glad to have been invited to be here with you this evening to present and to be part of the, uh, the lecture series. Uh, so I'm looking forward to sharing with you uh, just a little bit of my research. So my presentation this evening is titled One Too Many Black Lives, Reckoning with Ontario's History of Enslavement. The enslavement of uh, African people marks the physical, social, economic, and political landscapes of the province. Um, there were those that, who were enslaved and the practice was common across the province as, you will, as I will um, share with you this evening. Uh, and it's important to take a look at that and to see how that um, took place and unfolded. I do so in my dissertation research, One Too Many. I examine the history of enslavement to help better understand the scope and the nature of the institution and to better know the individuals who were enslaved, which is a very important um, element of my research. And as some of that I will share with you. I situate my ongoing historical investigation in the contemporary context of the social movement for Black lives, um, past and present. So just uh, in terms of a period of time of my research and writing this past spring and summer, um, I was, you know, doing a bit more work and newly settled into the restrictions um, due to COVID. And, um, and then we had the, you know, the, the social uprising in the spring carrying through to the summer, which, you know, was propelled um, by the murder of George Floyd, um, but which was also uh, a contributing uh, factor to a long history 
of, um, of circumstances of the disregard for black life. And, you know, at the time, you know, you know, researching the past and being in the present really clashed for me in very particular ways. Uh, and, and so I would go, I, I, you know, I start a little bit in the present and go back to, you know, the past in, in my research. One of the, you know, the, one of the core questions of my research is what can we understand about the is history of enslavement here in what we now call Ontario, um, specifically, but that question can and should also be brought into um, what can we understand about enslavement in Canada. Here in uh, colonial Ontario, there were upwards of 500 uh, African people who were enslaved by white settlers between 1760 and 1834. And this is during um, the, the British control of what we now call Canada. In the wider Canadian context, the institution of enslavement uh, was practiced for 206 years. We also can and should understand that enslavement here in Canada, uh, similar to the global context of the time, was chattel enslavement, race-based enslavement. It was sanctioned by law and sanctioned by custom. It existed from east to west in this province in both urban and rural spaces. And we also can understand that the labor of those who were enslaved and subjugated was exploited to grow personal wealth as well as the wealth of the colony. So as I mentioned in researching and continuing my work as best as I could given the restrictions um, and the lockdown, um, this past spring and summer, um, I wrote two articles for Spacing Magazine on my research. And when they were published, one thing that stood out and still stands out as a continuous thread is the value of Black lives, including the way that enslavement and those who were enslaved continue to be sidelined, are simultaneously valuable to and devalued by society. Um, and I will also come back to uh, just some of the um, public perspectives as it relates to these two articles, but also the broader discussion of enslavement that really um, picked up um, at that time at the end of the spring. Another, uh, uh, some other questions come to mind. Uh, it came to mind for me earlier at the beginning of my research, but also again, you know, thinking and reflecting on the next steps of my research. Why is it more known about this 206 year um, practice uh, in, in Canada? And how was enslavement taken up specifically here in colonial Ontario? Some of these questions are not as, you know, well known, the answers to them are not as well known because of a few things um, that I've been able to observe. Uh, first, how historians of Canada have treated the topic of enslavement. Uh, and yes, there were some historians at the, um, the late 1800s and going into the 20th century who did discuss enslavement. However, how the topic was, um, and how those more importantly, how those who were enslaved were treated in this, um, this uh, documentation of the history was a replication of their objectification and their voices and their experiences were not centered in the research. The history was really centered around those who were the enslavers. Another contributing factor is that the history, the reality of enslavement is not part of the national narrative of Canada. Uh, and what is interesting is that in, an, another, another um, experience of enslavement is 
very uh, tightly woven into the history of the national narrative of Canada, and that is the Underground Railroad. And so thinking about the ways that, uh, you know, one narrative which would uh, confirm involvement and complicity is not known, whereas another narrative that upholds, uh, that uh, places Canada in a favorable light is, you know, is part of that national narrative. And so there is, you know, something to be said about the way that enslavement and the lives of those who were enslaved are treated through um, the, the process of history making. Another contributing factor is the pervasive and persistent mythology that serves to sustain this, um, what we can call, uh, you know, this light version of Canada, of the nation of Canada. And the, the idea that the lesser numbers of those who were enslaved is used as a way to minimize that history. The fact that um, there wasn't a plantation economy here in Canada is also used in order to downplay the history of enslavement, as well as, you know, the views that, uh, um, the misinformation that seemingly enslavement was more benign here in Canada than in the United States or other places in the Americas. And that um, those who were enslaved were like part of the, the family of those who enslaved them. Um, these are some of the common uh, notions that serve to downplay and, and, and sideline the history. Um, of enslavement and does contribute to a level of denial around the importance, um, the foundational importance of enslavement. Uh, and then one other uh, interesting um, contributing factor to this denial or this disregard is, you know, there's often this argument put forth that, uh, well, technically it wasn't Canada that where people were enslaved because Canada didn't exist until 1867. Um, but if we look at that in, in, a, in a broader way in terms of how um, aspects of our colonial history are embraced and carried forward in the national narrative, in the recognition of Canada uh, under those, that word Canada versus what is, is, is marginalized and discarded, um, again, that whole process, that selective process, plays a role in us not knowing much about, not acknowledging, um, and, you know, I guess embracing, if you will, the realities of enslavement as part of our history. There has been this excising um, and sometimes, you know, the outright denial. And what I equate this denial to is the, to the denial of the lives of those that were enslaved. Enslaved people have been left out of the origin story that has been constructed about Canada. And part of the goals of my research is to, um, to trouble that and to develop research uh, that centers, again, the experiences and the lives of those who were enslaved. The efforts to deny the early subjugation of Black people on these colonized lands is an attempt to conjure up this notion of innocence and of um, you know, moral superiority often uh, towards our American counterparts. Uh, and again, the minimizing of the numbers of those who were enslaved demonstrates a level of indifference of Black life. So one question that should be asked, a critical question is, why was enslavement uh, the primary condition of Black people in colonial Ontario from the end of the 18th century into the early 19th century? My research helps to situate the institution of enslavement as a common feature and acceptable practice in colonial Ontario. The conceptualization of Canada in its early colonial iteration included the development of a state that employed the forced labor 
of enslaved Africans. And, and so in looking at um, the context of enslavement here in, on, in Ontario and in Canada, it needs to be situated um, and understood as Ontario uh, being a British colony uh, and the other colonies here in Canada. And they, they were very much as such entangled in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, for example, there were nine trade from Europe to Africa that were built here in the maritime provinces, 19 slave ships. The transatlantic slave trade was a core component of European imperialism and colonization. Uh, and this is just an example here where we see this trade where we, you know, we, we are aware of African peoples um, being taken from Africa, traded and enslaved in the Americas and, you know, forced to produce particular goods, um, rum and sugar and, 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 you know, just a range of other uh, goods that were then shipped to Europe and in, in for consumption and to other British colonies as well. Uh, we see this here again, um, you know, connecting back to Ontario. Here uh, I'm sharing with you just a snippet of a transcription of a ship manifest that um, arrived in the port of Quebec in 1818. And you will see here coming from Jamaica, coming from Bermuda, rum, sugar, coffee, uh, rum, sugar, molasses, goods that were produced by African people enslaved uh, in those places. And then we see that, you know, then connecting these goods being distributed to merchants in different towns and cities. Uh, here is an advertisement published in the Kingston Gazette, August 18th, 1812. And here we see a merchant, um, Mr. Whitney, who has an array of goods um, to, to sell fresh goods. Uh, here we see some sugar. I just uh, you can, I highlighted the word there, sugar. Part of this trade, uh, this trade um, involved the commodification of African people. So they're evaluated for their exploited labor, both their physical labor and the reproductive labor of women. Enslaved Africans uh, who were brought into Ontario were imported from the US which was a former British territory. And in the maritime, some of those who were uh, imported were also brought in from the Caribbean as well. Uh, and we see in, in different Canadian newspapers, uh, colonial newspapers, we see the, the advertisement of uh, African people for sale. So even though this is localized, it is very much part of that broader flow of the transatlantic slave trade. Part of the form, um, you know, as a, a, again in, in understanding the context of how enslavement uh, existed for in Canada and was an institution uh, for those years, uh, it's important again to see that as um, part of the British Empire, um, that there is a enslavement was part of the formation of a racial hierarchy under British colonial rule. And so we see this in the um, in understanding the organizing and the structuring of colonial Ontario, where white European white male dominated in terms of power and decision making, um, right, and influence. And then as it relates to uh, indigenous people and African people, were as those who were oppressed and subjugated under British colonial rule were at the lower end. And in colonial Canada, based on power broken relationships between British and Six Nations and other indigenous allies, that black African people were at the bottom of the rung, so to speak. And so what we see is that, um, and I'll talk a little bit about this as well, is that as it relates to the, the trading and the enslaving of African people, 
uh, that this was done at the hands of, of Europeans, uh, first the French and then the British, under, you know, after, throughout and after the American and the American Revolution, at the end of the American Revolution, we see that there's um, collusion between British military officers and soldiers and again, indigenous allies in the, the trading of, of African people. And then we have those African people who were enslaved and they did not enslave or trade others and they did not trade and enslave um, African people. They were uh, you know, denied their personhood um, through chattel enslavement. And so it's important again, when we're looking at the history of enslavement to, we have to untangle the realities and the roles of race um, throughout colonization and the role that race played in enslavement, again, it being a race-based um, institution. Indigenous allies adopted British views of African people. They were, you know, it's recorded of that uh, Black people being kidnapped and sold uh, and enslaved. And the numbers of, you know, as you transition from French to British colonial rule, this saw the change from an indigenous majority of those who were enslaved to um, an exclusive um, African population that was enslaved in Ontario. That number grew because of um, the role that indigenous allies played in capturing uh, enslaved Africans as spoils of war during the American Revolution and transported them into what we now call Ontario and gifted them to their loyalist comrades or sold them as well or exchanged them. Uh, so this we see that happening with the Brandt siblings, uh, Joseph Brandt pictured here and his sister Mary, also known as Molly, um, they were socialized into British norms and values, both of them enslaved Africans. Uh, Joseph enslaved upwards of 40 um, African people between his two properties in Burlington and Brantford. Uh, one traveler, a uh, European traveler, Mr. Well, uh, Wells, uh, who visited the province in uh, 17, late 1790s, noted that, um, you know, upon his visit there in, in, in the Grand River area, that this is one, one of his observations. Uh, his sister Molly, when she relocated into Kingston, Ontario, brought with her uh, two women and one man that she enslaved. And you will notice here in the representation of my slide as it relates to um, you know, those who were uh, viewed as part of the colonial structure or viewed as with some level of importance and value that I, there, to my knowledge, there is no period portrait of Black people to, in Ontario to show. And so I've chosen here instead to show an indinkra symbol, it's called an epa, and in English that means handcuffs. And um, this symbolizes uh, law and justice, slavery and captivity. Um, just recognizing again the history and the impact and the reality of enslavement. And so, you know, looking again and understanding that enslavement was a common feature, an acceptable practice in colonial Ontario. Um, it was again, part and parcel, it was part and parcel of, you know, some of the common ways of, of life. And we see um, through a, a couple of instances, the ways that uh, enslavement was accepted. We see, a, 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 an understanding or we get an understanding of the attitudes and the beliefs that existed that um, carried forward enslavement in the province uh, well after 1793 when the act to limit slavery uh, gradual abolition was introduced. We see here in, for example, uh, in this will, it's uh, there's actually quite a number of instances where uh, those who were enslaved are, are documented in wills, bequeathed to family members, 
And again, this shows the persistence of uh, pro, pro enslavement sentiments. And again, Pat, going here, we see 1805 is the date of the will of uh, Lieutenant John Young Sr. And here we see uh, his will in 1805. In his will, uh, John Young Sr. settled in Grand River in Haldeman County. And in his will, he bequeathed to his wife Priscilla um, along with some other property. And we see the listing and the order, a Negro woman named Dean, a Negro man named Jack, and a Negro woman named Leah. And then he says upon the death of his wife that the Negro man Jack is to be given to his son Abraham and the Negro woman to go to his daughter Elizabeth. And in this will, um, this is one example of some um, intricate arrangements for those who were enslaved, none of them being to free them or to manumit them. And you know, he says, just to paraphrase, he essentially says that if my wife chooses um, some other kinds of property, not the chattel property invested in, in these black people, that then if she chooses some other property that he has, then those that he enslaves can go to his children and to other children um, as well. But it's insistent in his will that they continue to be held in bondage. And then in another example from a will, this is the will of James Gurdy, uh, who settled in Essex County and was, uh, he worked in the Indian department as well. In his will, which was dated, um, I think it was 1807 and it was probated in 1817, um, that in his will years after uh, the 1793 act to limit slavery. Um, and in this will, he essentially bequeaths uh, six of the African people that he enslaved to his children. And he makes, um, di gives direction to say that any children born of the women who he is bequeathing, those children will also belong to his children and will be passed on um, hereafter, whichever children are hereafter born from their bodies and even the bodies of their children. So even after 1794, James Gurdy, you know, documented this as a way to say for however long enslavement may um, continue that the reproductive labor, the children of those who, the women who were enslaved will belong to my family. And so we see here, and this is an example of, you know, showing how the hereditary status of enslavement where children born to women who were uh, enslaved uh, took up the status of their mother unless they were manumitted. And it's worth noting that I have not, um, I don't know if any other researchers have, I haven't seen or heard of it, but I have not been able to locate any evidence of um, loyalist enslavers manumitting um, those who they, who, um, they enslaved outside of them, you know, of their passing. So that brings us to, you know, so taking a look at that, this again is just a couple of examples to illustrate the, the, the commonality um, of enslavement and the ways that Black lives were viewed, um, if simultaneously valued, as I said, uh, but on the other hand, devalued and dehumanized. The enslavement and subjugation and dehumanization of African people were core elements of British colonial ethos, and that included here in colonial Ontario. The institution of enslavement um, was also upheld and supported by various imperial acts of the British Parliament and um, legislation by the colonial government, including the 1793 Act to Limit Slavery. Uh, when this legislation was uh, took effect in July of 1793, uh, the result of legis the legislation was to gradually abolish enslavement over time. But one of the first things that it did was that it confirmed the ends of slavery, and it also confirmed that those who were enslaved at the time the legislation took effect would remain enslaved, remain in that, um, st that station in life, unless they were manumitted by those that enslaved them. <clears throat> 
this legislation came about, uh, their, their impetus was an incident or what is commonly called the Chloe Cooley incident that took place 228 years ago on March 14th. Um, so that uh, anniversary was uh, last on Sunday. And, uh, and before I tell you what happened there, but it's interesting to note that that inc incident was used by Lieutenant Governor John Grave Simcoe and Attorney General John White to introduce legislation to abolish enslavement. However, uh, quite a number of the members of the first parliament of the legislature of Upper Canada themselves enslaved Black people, uh, six out of 16 members of the assembly and six out of nine of the original members of the, the legislative council um, enslaved Africans or had family members who uh, enslaved African people. So in sharing the impetus of the introduction for legislation, I also want to get into another question, which is who were the people who were enslaved? in Upper Canada. And this is uh, an important inclusion in my research to ensure that as much as possible, I am pulling together these archival fragments and sharing a story, um, a biography, a narrative of the men, women, and children who were enslaved in this province. Chloe Cooley was one, uh, who a woman who was enslaved here in Upper Canada. She was first enslaved by Benjamin Hardison in Fort Erie, who was a politician. He sold her to Adam Vrooman in Queenston, um, in Queenston on, on Niagara area. And at, according to Vrooman's um, words, there was rumors that uh, Simcoe was going to abolish slavery and many and loyalists were attempting to um, or to mitigate their potential losses by selling those as those that they enslaved into the United States from the Canadian side into into New York. And this is what Adam Grumman decided to do on March 14, 1793. Uh, with the assistance of a few other loyalist men, they forcefully bound, tied up, bound Chloe Cooley put her in a, um, in a boat and sailed across the Niagara River. And, uh, you know, based on the historical record, uh, Chloe Cooley screamed um, severely, violently, and she was heard by Peter Martin, who was a Black loyalist, and William Grizzly, who was a white laborer on Grumman's property. And they reported this incident to the executive council, to um, John Graves Simcoe and, and others who were part of the executive council. And this is how the legislation came to be introduced. Uh, we don't know what happened to Chloe Cooley at the, um, after, her, um, after she was sold, but we know that in her capacity as an enslaved woman, that her in her exploited labor was used in uh, the domestic realm to do all kinds of domestic uh, work in the households of the um, the Hardisons and the Vroomans, uh, assisting in in taking care of the children, doing household chores, some of the the you know the farming work as well, and you know these were some of the things that Chloe Cooley's labor um, was exploited to do. So there's been, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about efforts to commemorate uh, those enslaved generally and uh, Chloe Cooley specifically as we see here, but I'll talk about that in a little bit. I also wanted to share the story of Sophia Cooley um, who was enslaved by Joseph Grant. And we learn about her story uh, through the recording of interviews that were taken that took place between Benjamin Drew, a white abolitionist from Boston, and freedom seekers who had settled here in the province. He came here and traveled across interviewing uh, freedom seekers in different places 
to get a sense of how they were faring here in their life in freedom. And when he went to the Queen's Bush, north of um, the Waterloo area, one of the people that he interviewed was Sophia Cooley. And so we hear as close as possible from her very own words, her story of being enslaved. She talks about being captured as a young child, um, her sister and, and, and herself in New York uh, with, uh, from, by indigenous allies and you know, was passed on and traded on and came into, to be in the possession of Joseph Brandt. And she talks about uh, living with the Brants for 12 or 13 years, uh, moving or being brought in through Niagara and then settling uh, in, 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 in Burlington with the family. And she talks about uh, you know, her experience uh, here as well as you can see in reading her words. She talks about learning the language and how um, you know, she went hunting. She would go hunting with the Brants children she talked about her, um, her harsh treatment at the hands of uh, Joseph Brandt's wife and encountering John Chisholm and Ben and Bill Chisholm, William Chisholm, um, and Bill Chisholm being noted as one of the founders of, um, of Oakville. And so this is really, um, you know, quite a, a striking artifact of the history of enslavement in the province. It is her story is one of two known firsthand accounts of people who were enslaved in the province as children and who, um, you know, in their adulthood were able to enjoy their freedom. Another story that I would like to share uh, is that the story of Joseph Duchess. He was enslaved by lawyer and judge Richard Cartwright, uh, initially in Niagara on the Lake area. And then when he relocated in his, on his land grant in Kingston, that is where they resided. When Richard Cartwright passed away, uh, Joseph Duchess came to be uh, the property of his son, John S. Cartwright. His story is also interesting for a number of reasons. It, high, it, it gives a little bit of a sense of someone who um, was imported into the province, uh, enslaved, and whose death is documented as we see here in his obituary in 1842. Um, but it's also interesting because we see uh, a level of resistance uh, in his story uh, just as one example of those who were enslaved and the different ways that those who were enslaved resisted their forced condition. In August of 1787, Joe Gutches attended a board of inquiry, which was set up and was traveling in different uh, settlements at the time in order to hear a range of grievances. And in the records, it notes that a black man by the name of Joe um, appears in front of the board, he brings his grievance to the board. And what he says is that he was taken by the Indians um, and he was sold as a slave for life. But at the time of his capture, that he was only supposed to serve until he was 21 and then he was to be free. But that he was at the, uh, sorry. So then it in this hearing, um, What's also interesting is that another enslaved man by the name of Cornelius, um, Joe used him as a witness to, to vouch for him. And Cornelius's testimony is also documented very briefly. He was enslaved by Captain Herkimer. And he says, he informs the board that, um, that Joe had been sold in the States and confiscated as property and that he joined the British um, military afterwards on the faith of the proclamation and that's Lord Dunmore's proclamation for freedom that promised it manumission to such as would quiet their master um, would quiet their masters and so here we see just very briefly in this case that Joe that Joseph makes a plea for his freedom that another enslaved man's word is actually taken as testimony um, Richard Cartwright does respond and he argues um, against this, saying that he legally owned 
Joseph Duchess having purchased him, purchased him in Niagara from um, someone in the Indian department. Uh, in later records, Joseph Gutches continues to appear in the, um, in the Cartwright family records. And again, um, we see here in his obituary that he remained living with John Cartwright, the son, until his passing. The Lieutenant Governor General, uh, Sir Alexander Campbell, who grew up in Kingston, noted that he personally knew of two people who were enslaved in Kingston from an early, from early settlement, and that included Joseph Gutches. He says that he remembers them in their old age, each of them having a cottage um, surrounded by many comforts on the on the family property. Uh, and so again, we see again the, 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 the locating of those who were enslaved in this earlier history um, through a number of, of, of stories. In sharing some of these biographical stories, which is a method that I will be using in my research, in my dissertation as well, I, I really want to bring home um, the humanity of these individuals who were enslaved, uh, recognizing them as mothers, as fathers, as spouses, as siblings, and as offspring. So getting back to contemporary times, how can we reckon with our past of enslavement? Enslavement was practiced in Canada for 206 years, and it was a part of the fabric and the landscape of early Ontario. And we continue to see that today in the ways that, you know, the colonial origins, the naming, the markers point to those who were enslavers, um, but not to those who were enslaved. Um, and it's interesting to note as well that, you know, a lot of the recognition of this colonial past erases the, um, the practice of enslavement of individuals who are often more noted in being founders of particular towns and locations. Um, and as again, the erasure of those who were enslaved. Uh, I don't know if, if you have heard about the, the story of these guerrilla signs that appeared in a number of locations in the summer. Um, and they point to just uh, three of families, loyalist families, who enslaved um, primarily Black and the, the Babe family also enslaved some Indigenous people. Between the Babes, the Jarvises, and the Russells, um, who were politicians and members of the loyalist elite, they were known to have enslaved approximately 30 Black and Indigenous people over at least three generations. So this speaks to how entrenched and commonplace and accepted the practice of enslavement was. However, the people who they enslaved, as I said, were individuals and human beings who were not contemplated as part of the collective remembering of our colonial past. And so to reckon with that, we need to see the truth, hear the truth, and tell the truth, to acknowledge and to remember. Um, acknowledge that race-based enslavement precedes the nation states of the Americas, including Canada, which means that enslavement was a formal part of their interconnected economic, social, and political foundations. That we need to, in this truth telling, acknowledge that as much as that there were those who were enslaved, that there were those who did the enslaving as well. And again, we often see many markers uh, pointing to some of these, these loyalist uh, founders but the, the history of um, their enslaving African people is not noted. That includes here, William Walbridge, and we see uh, the town of Walbridge, we see uh, uh, streets uh, here off the 401, 
named after uh, the Walbridge family. And then just as another example, uh, uh, Finkel's, what's now Finkel Shore Park, uh, again is named after uh, loyalist Henry Finkel who enslaved uh, a woman named Mary. And, um, and just going back to Walbridge, that William H. Walbridge enslaved a woman by the name of Bet and her infant son. So this, again, so the acknowledgement and the, um, the remembering um, means that, that there should be more memorials to those who were enslaved. Uh, I shared with you the slide there with Chloe Cooley that showed the plaque um, that was uh, installed in her honor in 2007. And um, here is the Voices of Freedom Park in Niagara on the lake. And this park commemorates the experiences of Black people in Niagara in, in the lake, including those that were enslaved. In my work, as get, I went to unearth this, the history of enslavement and, and cover those who were enslaved, I have developed a, a walking tour for downtown Toronto called Brought in Bondage, Enslaved Blacks in the Town of York. And this tour focuses on remembering those who were enslaved in downtown Toronto. There are no markers in other places that encourage the public to remember the lives of the African people who were enslaved. And I also, in, in so thinking about this commemoration, the honoring um, and the remembering of people who were enslaved and making them part of the, the public conscious that you know, we need to improve and increase our efforts in order to, uh, to remember them. March 25th is designated as the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the Transatlantic Slave Trade. And this uh, marks the anniversary of the legislation by the British Parliament to end the trade in African people from the continent across the Atlantic Ocean. It did not abolish the practice of enslavement. And so at that 200, the 200th anniversary in uh, 2007, the, the plaque in honor of Chloe Cooley was installed due to the efforts of uh, Dr. Afua Cooper, who was leading uh, commemorative uh, initiatives for the 200th uh, anniversary of this legislation. And so that plaque is located along the Niagara Parkway um, in honor, it located on the property where she was once enslaved. The, you know, I, well, I'll close by saying that, you know, in taking a look at this history and in carrying on my research, that I really do want to bring home um, the importance of recognizing and honoring and valuing the lives of those who were enslaved. And in carrying out uh, my research again last spring and last summer uh, and seeing some of the the public comments, not on the articles, but also public comments around the conversation of enslavement, which really heightened at that time with the conversations around anti-Black racism and systemic discrimination. Um, it really landed hard and does demonstrate the ways that the lives of those who were enslaved again are reduced um, in this conversation. And so one aim for my research is to spur the creation of sites of memory to the enslaved that seeks to honor their humanity and to make them permanently visible. And another part of that is to contribute to this whole process of reckoning, um, where, because Canada has yet to reckon with our slave past. And in doing so, then we are not uh, fully able to contextualize the enduring legacies of the institution of enslavement with we, which we are confronted with today. So I will close there and say thank you for um, listening and I will welcome your questions at this time. Thank you very much, Natasha. You're welcome.
All right. So for everyone in the audience, um, we'll let Natasha here enter uh, her share screen. And then if you want to add your um, questions to the chat, um, you can go ahead and start entering those now for us. Um, I do have one that was sent to me privately, so we will start with that. Um, so we did have a question come in and say, is the Ministry of Education interested in including this part of our history in the school curricula? Or is there any politician, school board, or textbook company that wants to have this taught? So it's so interesting. That's the first question I get because I deliberated whether or not to get into the conversation around curriculum because I speak about it endlessly. So, and I decided not to, and here I am. That's the first question, so which is good. Uh, so as part of my research as well, because um, you know I do a lot of work around curriculum, uh, in taking a look at the, the social studies, history and geography curriculum, the topic of, of, of enslavement was just included in 2013. And it's actually only included as an optional topic. So it's not discussed as part of the colonial, the colonization of Canada in any way. Um, so to my understanding and just on you know just on anecdotal evidence there aren't a lot of teachers who teach enslavement and again you know even just thinking about what i've shared that not a lot of people are aware of that history and so you don't you have people who are not a lot are not aware and then there aren't a lot of resources around that um i've taught i've developed some resources that help in some examination of you know the history of enslavement so what I would like to see is I would like to see um, enslavement as part of the, the curriculum, as part of the deepening of exploring the colonial beginnings of Canada, which I think needs to be strengthened. So that should be included in that. Uh, and then on top of that, and then outside of my discussion here on enslavement, that there be some learning expectations around um, Black Canadian history because there aren't any. Um, there, you know, the 400 year presence of black people here in Canada, there's nothing that all students in Ontario have to learn about uh, in order to ground their understanding of that. And so some of the materials that I've uh, developed, uh, someone has asked about access, I've just seen it pop up there. So I, I gather different resources that I've developed and resources um, from museums and archives on a range of topics including enslavement on my website, Teaching African Canadian History. And so you can take a look there to see some of the resources that are there. Um, and then another extension of my dissertation research, once that's finished, um, I want to not, it's not only a, a traditional written dissertation, but I am putting together a, a database to pull together all of these fragments, these pieces of these stories that are in different archives to create a database um, where you can uh, one stop, you know, one stop shopping, if you will, a one place uh, repository uh, that gain, helps to teach about and learn about the enslavement of African people here in Ontario, and then to go on to develop some resources to support the instruction of that because the content is important, but how it's taught is also important as well. Yeah, and there's kind of a related question here that's come in. Um, so um, you've been thanked for the presentation. And again, thank you very much um, for speaking with us tonight. And then they continue on to say, how are you planning to promote and get um, built these sites for memory? Um, so you mentioned a process of reckoning. And can you just expand on that a bit? Um, is it similar to the truth and reconciliation in Canada? So I just, I say wrecking in terms of awareness and education. Um, so I, it's a, I guess, in a sense, any kind of process of truth telling and reconciliation requires the, um, the recognition of a history and the experiences, the wrongs, if you will. And so, you know, when I talk about reckoning, it is, you know, it's, it's ensuring or locating that history in Canadian history, in Ontario history, that it becomes part of uh, public knowledge. Um, you know, and as much as other aspects of our colonial history is, is, is recognized. Uh, I, and when I talked about developing sites of memory, I, I mean, I wish I could, you know, do all, make it all on my own. But what I want to do is I want to, you know, through my work and through building that awareness is hopefully to motivate 
um, local, local places, historic organizations, uh, towns, um, particularly towns that, you know, um, maintain their strong loyalist heritage, that they, as part of those commemorations, that they also acknowledge those who were enslaved as well. And so that is some of what I would like to see um, taking place. And, you know, and for myself as president of the Ontario Black History Society, uh, you know, working with uh, organizations in order to again to share this history and to mark some of these sites were, were connected to those who were enslaved. And jumping off of that point, there's a question here saying outside of formal education context, um, are there organizations that are doing a decent job of teaching African Canadian history in your view? Um, so this individual who submitted the question says that they work in education um, and they're creating or discussing the creation of a workshop and just wanted to hear if there were some examples that you're aware of. Well, I that's the work that I do, and I did it because, and I do it because it it wasn't um, not that it wasn't being done, but in terms of uh, a broader scale uh, supporting, for example, school boards, um, there wasn't, and there isn't, there isn't a job that exists for someone in order to do that. The work that I do, for example, is done um, independently. Uh, and so there does need to be, um, and I'm not the only one who does it. And so there needs to be, there needs to be people who are allowed to do this kind of work um, in support of wider efforts around equity and addressing anti-Black racism. Um, I, it's an important part of that as we continue to do work in education to decolonize the curriculum, to integrate uh, Black Canadian narratives, for example, which is the work that I support. Um, so, you know, so there's there's myself and there's a, a couple of other people. Uh, but then there are individual teachers who have been and continue to do, you know, great work in their classrooms and in their schools. Um, and so we may not necessarily know about all of them, but we know that, you know, some teachers are doing that work. And so what I would like to see is more system support in that regard of, you know, professional learning of resources uh, in order to support teachers um, who are doing that work. Yeah, we've talked a lot about um, awareness and systems and that kind of line of thinking. Um, I just want to go back up to one of the first questions that came in, which was talking about reparations um, and just your view on what reparations should Canada give to those owing. So you can read the second article <laughs> that I, I wrote, the spacing article, and I taught uh, I have different arguments um, that outline redress and what that can and should look like. Uh, again, so looking at the former talk, uh, looking at where were the conversations in the spring, um, connecting that to the historic realities of enslavement. Um, and so what does that mean when you have a history of, of entrenched systemic anti-Blackness that has produced disparate outcomes and disadvantage for Black people? Um, if we just look at one stream, for me, education as an educator and at the work that I've done looking at the history of education and the experiences of Black students, that immediately after 1834, when slavery was abolished in British colonies, that led to an increase in uh, freedom seekers into Ontario, that immediately there were racially segregated schools put in place um, in, in places that had high population um, of Black people. Uh, and that is built into, as a colonial institution, is built into the public education. Uh, and so if we're talking about redress and reparations, what can and should that look like, recognizing the historical patterns of, um, uh, of outcomes for Black students, that there needs to be um, a particular um, redress and educational debt, if you will, for, the, for that. So that's only just one, right? So that's just one stream of experience as it relates to uh, Black Canadians. Uh, and so, you know, there needs to be that conversation. I think the first article I wrote uh, was around the question um, that uh, pri the Prime Minister evaded in terms of when will the apology come for enslavement? Um, and he didn't answer the question. And, it, and so, you know, if you're making these statements and taking knees about anti-Black racism, but you don't want to acknowledge 
the roots of you know where we are today how can we how could we even think that we can move forward in any meaningful transformational way and so there needs to be a conversation around what that redress and what racial justice should look like for black Canadians. Um, and then just one last example as well. I think I just saw maybe not even two weeks ago, an article that I think is the provincial government of Nova Scotia or the federal government is finally going to help to take care of outstanding land grant claims of African Nova Scotians going back to the loyalist period. Um, right, how many decades, how, right, a couple of hundreds of, of years of, of that. Um, thinking about families that were denied the ability to mortgage property um, to, in order to, 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 to fund um, possibilities and futures for their families. Um, while, you know, while that wasn't an obstacle for, for, for white loyalists in the same systemic way. So then what, does, what should that redress look like for this intentional um, disadvantaging? So we, there definitely needs to be a conversation around that in different, in different areas. And on a semi-related note, um, somebody has asked here on, um, what's your opinion on pulling down statues of the leaders in Canada that were slave owners? Um, so is that the right thing to do? Or are you more of the opinion that we should be doing something like putting up the plaques that recognize um, the other side of the story and having those two pieces together? Well, I think it's it's a conversation. It's a, it's a public conversation to have um, as we continue to uh, to publicly display what we feel are our shared values um, is are these the things that we want to display as as our shared values um, and that's an important conversation and it's a it's a hard conversation because as a colony we essentially um, you know just looking at some of the street names looking at Dundas Street for example looking at uh, Russell Township looking at all of these markers of colonization how, um, you know, how, are you, like, what do we do with that history? And so I don't provide, um, you know, I can't tell people what to do, but those conversations need to be had. And I think that if we want to move again in a direction of reconciliation with Indigenous people, if we want to move in, in this, you know, uh, towards racial justice, that these things have to be revisited. And, and, and so it also means as well that if we are renaming or um, sharing different images of our collective values, that they also need to broaden to other groups of people as well um, as representative of whether it's local communities or the province, that these things are also representative of, of, of uh, diverse groups of, of Canadians. And uh, yeah, we've had a couple comments um, come in. Just thank you very much um, again for speaking and for providing all this background information. Um, so I do want to acknowledge those comments because there are quite a few of them coming in. Um, and the next question actually um, starts getting back to some of that um, generational history. But are there people living here now who know that they are the descendants of slaves in Ontario? Um, or did those people who were here just lose their history? You know, so there's two things. Um, there are, so there are descendants and over time there has been a lot of interracial um, marriages and so uh, for some people you may not necessarily present as, um, as African or Black, um, so there's that. Uh, there are, um, I, and I continue to, 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 to look for more as well. Um, but in my research, there, there is um, a couple of particular families who can trace uh, this, the, the descendants um, from an, an ancestor who, who was enslaved. Um, and so those are some of the things when we talk about um, processes of erasure, it doesn't have to necessarily be intentional, but just that over time, um, you know, these things don't, are not necessarily uh, evident in terms of that, that legacy. And what was there's there was a second part to that question? Uh, the people who so are there people who are here who still know their descendants, or were there other people who just lost that history? Mm -hmm. that uh, so I don't I don't know if, about the the losing their their history. Uh, you know, another thing as well in terms of the record keeping of those who were enslaved is that they were chattels. 
they were property and so they show up in the records as such um and so you know we don't have family trees to go back to and these genealogical traces these are not things that are prevalent as it relates to the history of, of enslavement and so it's not as easy to to, to demonstrate um, and then you know something that's also um, I think will always be troubling to me as well is that when you see that those who were enslaved and you're not able to trace their life their life even into their deaths and some of their deaths were not recorded and so we don't even know, right? We don't even know that. Um, and then sometimes too, those who were brought in um, and, and traded, though some of these things were not documented. Um, and so, you know, those are some of the, the unknowns and those gaps that, that we have to live with. But again, there are some stories that help to at least elucidate uh, even a bit um, some of that uh, generational generational uh, presence in, in the province. All right. And um, as a final question, um, as there's been a number of people commenting on your work as well, could you maybe just uh, wrap up just what's the best way for people to find your work and to support you and just to keep learning more as you continue your research? So my website, teachingafricancanadianhistory.com. Uh, and uh, it's been a, an exceptionally busy Black History Month, um, so I haven't been doing much dissertating, <laughs> but I will be uh, getting back to some of that work and continuing um, my writing. And and I, it was great to be able to you know to be invited to speak here because I do enjoy uh, sharing my work in these forums and getting you know getting feedback. Um, and, and to see the interest in this history uh, really does help to, to, to motivate me as, as well as I continue to do this work. So, you know, once that is, is finished, I, I would like to continue to share because another important aspect for me is if I talk about raising public awareness is that I want to do as much as I can um, through different platforms in order to increase the awareness of this history. All right, so thank you very much, Natasha, uh, for joining us tonight. Um, on behalf of the Halton Hills Public Library, the Friends of the Halton Hills Public Library, CFUW Georgetown, and our audience who is with us here tonight, um, we thank you very much uh, for speaking. Thank you, thank you everyone, have a good night. Now for the rest of the audience, if you enjoyed tonight's event, um, please note that our next lecture is with Paul Noonan on Tuesday, April 6th, and that is for engaging the Jane Finch community. Um, so registration for that event is now live through the library's website. Um, so once again, thank you, Natasha, for speaking. And thank you very much to the audience for joining us. And we hope that all of you enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>